My name is Kisa Harley, and I'm the Education and Curatorial Initiatives Manager here at Hanford Mills Museum. And I'm just going to give you a very brief introduction to Hanford Mills, since I know we have some folks who have may have not been to the site before. We are a historic mill site, a water-powered site and steam-powered site located in East Meredith. Um, for those of you who are familiar with the Catskills and kind of East Central part of New York, we're about 10 miles east of Oneonta. We are, the sawmill itself was built in 1846 and the businesses continued to operate until the mid 1960s. The greatest expansions of the mill took place between 1860 and 1900 under DJ Hanford and his sons, Will and Horace. And that's why we are named Hanford Mill Museum. Uh, the businesses included a grist mill, woodworking shop and a retail shop business. And the family also operated a dairy farm. Today, we are a working historic mill site where we still use a water wheel and steam plant to run sawmill, grist mill, and woodworking machinery. And we updated our mission in 2010 uh, to have a focus in sustainability. And now I'm going to turn things over to Liz Callahan, our executive director, to get started. Thank you, Kisa. I'm Liz Callahan, the executive director of Hanford Mills Museum, and I would like to thank our presenters tonight and our um, moderator tonight. So this program is brought to you uh, thanks to a creativity incubator grant from the Greater Hudson Heritage Association and um, through the New York State Council on the Arts. I want to acknowledge that because it's been really an important uh, driver in the development of this series. And uh, the, without their support, we would not have been able to do it. Uh, we'd also like to thank the Cooperstown Graduate Program, specifically Dr. Will Walker and uh, his uh, graduate students who are working closely with him on this Creativity Incubator Series process, including currently Shia, Shia Muggan and Anna Memorino, and in the past, uh, Kirby Sandrial and Hanford Mills intern Sarah Grantham. And uh, we really appreciate all of the hard work these very talented students and Dr. Walker have done for this program. Uh, we'd like to welcome tonight our two guests. Uh, Ellen Wong and Lisa Tessier. Let me tell you a little bit about them and then we'll let the show go on and they can tell you about their work and what inspires them. Ellen is a landscape painter and visual artist whose work focuses on rural and working landscapes, especially of agricultural surroundings in, in Roxbury, New York, where she lives. She co-hosts the Farm Hour on WIOX, a weekly radio show about local agriculture. And she's done that for about a decade. And she's the founding member of the Longyear Gallery in Margaretville. Her artwork has been featured in many individual and group shows in upstate New York and in New York City. Ellen's multifaceted background includes teaching art for 25 years, teaching museum educators at the Bank Street College in New York City, and helping develop visitor engagement strategies for the Whitney Museum of Art and D DIA Arts Foundation. Ellen has a Bachelor's of Fine Arts from Brooklyn College, a Master's from the Bank Street College of Education, and has studied at the School of Visual Arts, Parsons School of Design, and the Art Students League. Her residencies and fellowships have included DIA Arts, Gilder Lehman Institute for American History, and uh, Yale, Amherst, Gettysburg, and Skidmore College residencies. And Lisa, just like the native plants that anchor her work, Lisa Tessier and her family are deeply rooted in the Hanford Muse Mills Museum community. And we are delighted to welcome her as a presenter with expertise in both landscape design and art making. Lisa is an Associate Professor of Arts and Sciences at the College uh, at Delhi, the SUNY College at Delhi, where her classes include Sustainable Design and Planning and Environmental Arts in America. Lisa's place-based artwork includes sun prints with native plants, watercolor landscapes, and basketry. Lisa's sun prints have been shown at Hartwick 
Hartwood College's Echo Art Festival and the Fenimore Art Museum's Art by the Lake. Lisa has two degrees in landscape architecture, a bachelor from Cornell University and a master's from SUNY College of Environmental Science and Forestry. And she taught at SUNY College of Environmental and Science and Forestry and has worked for two landscape architecture firms and for a nonprofit called the Center for Community Design and Research at ESF. We're very lucky to have both of them tonight and I can't wait for them to tell you about the things they're passionate about. Thank you. All right, Catskill Landscapes, uh, Ellen Wong, Catskill Landscapes. I think, I, is it 25 minutes yet? <laughs> um, working in American tradition. Um, you could see that I was not hired for my technical abilities, although it has been running perfectly. Um, so very sorry about that. Um, anyway, um, I'd like to welcome, good evening and welcome you. Um, as in many things in life, uh, it's hard to know what you sign up for when you take a leap and plunge. However, uh, this opportunity to reflect upon my work as an artist living part-time for the past 30 years in the village of Roxbury, New York has been most welcome at this present moment when I have been residing here during most of the past year. During this year, I've taken a leave from the Long Year Gallery, which I have been a founding member of since uh, 2007, and struggled to create new work in a place which has sustained and inspired me these many years. Looking back has really helped, has helped me to see the constancy and through lines that run like the rivers and roads through most of my work. It has been amazing for me to see this thread. And that's what I would like to share uh, with you this evening in my presentation. Place has always been central to my work. Each painting drawing focuses our attention on a moment in time in a specific here and now, in a specific place, local, mostly local, sometimes within a mile of where I live. I return to several places over and over again with new perceptions, as well as the constant changes of atmosphere, weather, seasons, the time of the day, and my own evolving sense of what moves me to want to share it with my community. And of course, why should it work <laughs> the way I want it to? Uh, so this first image, um, it was actually from a show in 1996, uh, I applied and received a fellowship, um, an edu uh, education fellowship with the, from the National Endowment for the Arts. And um, it was entitled Catskill Landscapes, Working in an American Tradition. Um, I had uh, been very interested in, in learning more about the Hudson River painters. And I know Lisa and I actually had talked about, uh, we both, uh, have, have some background with this. I think her and her teaching and, and me in this, with this grant. And so um, I proposed a, a study, a very intensive study, and I really took it very seriously and uh, went out and, and bought a, a new camera and uh, old Holland paints and uh, put everything in my car and basically uh, contacted the many, many of the places that uh, had collections and also archives, uh, wonderful archives of uh, uh, Thomas Cole work, uh, Frederick, Frederick Church. Um, and ultimately I fell in love with Sanford R. Gifford's um, luminous paintings. He was a second generation painter. And, um, and, I, and I studied their work and I you know, spent countless hours and I kept a journal and I like to read some of the journal. Um, I must say, and, and you probably can believe me as you see how hard it was for me to get this working properly. Um, I couldn't sync the uh, entries from my journal with the appropriate paintings. Um, I can only say that uh, a picture is worth a thousand words and, and um, if you look at all these images, I mean, I think my work speaks for me and, and what I value and valued all these years here. But um, the realization that 
uh, I had gone to uh, art school and I had, you know, been a, in major art in high school and I had always been in so-called artist, but um, in art school, I was an abstract painter and somehow uh, whenever I would travel, I would take watercolors and, and just kind of spend hours trying to see where I was. And uh, this grant, uh, moving to, uh, buying a house in Roxbury in 89 and then um, uh, getting this grant was, was an incredible, uh, it really changed my life. And now looking back over these 25 years and seeing the majority of the work has been really these landscapes and, and uh, both the uh, rural working landscape and, and the, uh, just the rural landscape. So, um, these are some of the paintings from that first show uh, that was the culmination of the grant. And that was in 1998 at the Roxbury Arts Group. Um, uh, you will see this place throughout my presentation. It's the East Branch of the Delaware River on Briggs Road. Um, you can usually find me there. I've been there in every season, uh, every time of day. Um, lately, I haven't been good about getting there. Um, at dawn, but but I'm pretty good at dusk. <laughs> and um, it's an incredible place and it's changed a lot. A lot of things have been cut back. Um, beavers have uh, dammed up part of the river, but I kayak here and it, it, it's an incredible place. Uh, and with the mountains in the distance, it's looking north. Uh, it's sort of south of the village of Roxbury and looking north. Um, so I just wanted to give a, a few examples of uh, Thomas Cole's painting. Um, and he, he really is considered the founder of the Hudson River School. And um, he, you know, he left an extraordinary legacy and very involved in allegories and metaphorical paintings. And uh, in his work, uh, nature really was, was God. I mean, nature was sublime. And he often, um, had very dramatic paintings to show uh, uh, progress and changes, this sort of disfigured uh, um, trees and crags in, in the front of the painting and then the very dramatic uh, wild uh, mountains and looks like waterway in the back. Um, and uh, the painting is, um, I believe it, wait. <laughs> You're, I'm looking, it is being hidden and I, uh, sunrise in the Catskills. Well, I guess he made it up for the sunrise. Um, I have another coal and this is river in the Catskills. And I, I've actually drawn this and sketched it out. I, I just, I love, I love it. And I love the, um, just the way the, the vista, it stretches out and um, the foreground, uh, I believe it. I'm not sure if it's by Catskill Creek, but uh, he did a lot of paintings there. And then this is a, a, a detail of a, a painting uh, of the Catskill Mountain House uh, uh, from Sanford Robinson Gifford. And, and that's really who I, I ended up finding his uh, day books, many, many of them uh, at um, uh, Vassa College uh, Museum, uh, their art center. and. Uh, you know, a woman came out to me and gave me these books, these small sketchbooks, and I, it was incredible. And at first she said to wear the white gloves, but they were inhibiting us. So she had me wash my hands and I spent hours. I just couldn't believe the drawings were just extraordinary. I mean, I, I write about them in the journal, but uh, he, he also had a New York studio and, and his New York studio was where I lived in the city. Um, when I was, maybe not when I was doing the research, but, but before that on West 10th Street. So um, it, it's kind of interesting. Um, and I read a quote that said that, um, I think uh, it was Kevin Avery, who was a curator at the Met when I was doing my research. And um, he curated this exhibit at, the, uh, at Thomas Cole's house. I think it's Cedar Grove at the museum uh, in 2017. It was an incredible exhibit. Um, and of course I was there still studying Sanford R. Gifford, but it said that, that he was made as an artist in the Catskills. And um, in spite of all the painting and, and studying I did before, I have to agree that I feel that that 
that I've been fired <laughs> in the Catskills as well. Um, so I wanna, I have no sense of time and I'm gonna kind of move quickly, but these are some of the early um, paintings that I was doing. I was painting here and also um, uh, going to the sites that they painted. And uh, let me see if I could find just maybe uh, one or two uh, excerpts to read. Um, raining, uh, not that day, uh, pouring, took a ride up to the golf course road, remembered a spot I think is beautiful, expand colors incredible in the rain, intensity dripping, green and gray, the clouds moving. I'm just going to move to the next one um, because this again is not, I don't have this painting anymore and you know someone is enjoying it. The clouds moving, um, enshrouding masses of green mountains, rain forming yet another layer, great movement and drama, great beauty, greens and grays, tiny red barn in the distance, difficult to capture, density of clouds and mist, even density of mountains and trees. Am I more moved by this vision, vision because I don't regularly see this? Brooding nature, watercolors seem too flimsy for the layers density, maybe just my inability to make them work. Um, driving out, Thomas Cole didn't have the luxury and protection of an automobile. Um, I'll read just a few more as I move through the slides. Uh, to paint landscape is to be a poet. And I believe that's from um, Poetic Landscape, a book on Gifford's landscapes. but. There is poetry in nature, changing in form, state color, sitting by a waterfall in the morning, the delicate shadow of a little seedling on a rock, the small, the details, the subtle nuance, the shadows and shape. Try to deal with rushing water, preparation for going to Catasco Falls, crashing, pounding, inundating, how to paint, to draw. It becomes a technical challenge, not an experience of nature. I wish to illuminate and share different from the landscape that moves me, the vista horizon, as far as the eye can see, capturing forms of mountains and quality of mist and clouds, colors, values, vastness. I come up against my same obstacles, judging, looking for the perfect scene. Nature is so different for Cole and Gifford, yet it becomes a true refuge from the chaos of city life. I think Emerson said, that, um, oh yes, he did. Emerson says, you can find God in the valleys, in the landscape, in the closeness to nature. Uh, to nature. Um, so still at the, um, at the river, the east branch of the Delaware on Briggs Road in autumn. And now I've moved up the river a little north and um, I've become more interested in a way in, in how we live. And so there's the creamery. Um, and um, I have another slide and I have some interesting history on the creamery. Um, and also the road has invaded my landscape and um, Route 30 and the cars and uh, the signage in a way. Um, I think there was a, a boat uh, starting to uh, canoe their way as I was painting. Um, this uh, I, I call the view to the 1800s. Um, it was the kind of postcard, the piece uh, from a show that I did in uh, in um, 2017 uh, called uh, basically Greetings from the Catskills. Uh, and this is from Dugan Hill Road on top of a, a friend who's a sculptor, an incredible sculptor, has a like a museum on top of his, his property. And, you can look out and it seems like you could see the 1800s um, and the Route 30 to Grand Gorge is a little ribbon that it, it's just an amazing view. Um, again, from Mount Atsiantha in Stamford, uh, looking down and looking north at the valley and the farms below. Um, you know, when I would do this work, I guess I couldn't help but remember uh, how amazing uh, Hudson River painters were at capturing the, this landscape. Um, my own predilection for the wintry, stark <laughs> and gray um, wintry landscapes. This is Hockets, Hockettsville, um, maybe six miles uh, south of, of Roxbury. 
and uh, winter deer. And I, I love they get their winter coat on and um, always, always seeming to be deer in the, uh, and I probably was in my car. <laughs> um, and this is another view of, of uh, I think it's, it's Lake Wawaka. I don't quite understand. It's the East Branch, but it was dammed up so they can control it. Um, a lot of, we do a lot of boating there, but um, this is uh, in late summer and you know, the mist and the reflect, it's just so beautiful. And here I am back home with Roxbury Fields. Uh, again, just not, not wanting maybe the details so much and just the sense, just the, really the geometry and the, the feeling of the fields and somehow knowing that the things are growing here. Um, another location that I uh, started painting many years ago, in fact, most of these buildings aren't here anymore, is uh, I, I call it Railroad Avenue, but it could be Depot Street. It, it's where the uh, Delaware and Ulster, the scenic railway comes in, but it used to be a, a, not a scenic railway. And um, there's a, um, uh, I guess it works in con concrete form. So there's a business that works and uses this form. I think it's uh, Bulger and I'm trying to think of who else, but they do uh, excavation. And um, I've always kind of been enchanted with this place. Um, rocks uh, here, uh, the Manhattan Country School Farm. Uh, it's a, a private school in Manhattan. And um, they have a farm in Roxbury and Walt, Walt Mead was the, Walter Mead, uh, the photographer. He ran the farm for a while, the farm school actually. Um, again, I just love the way the roads cut in and shape the land. Another road. <laughs> and this is Madeline. I do the farm hour with Madeline and this is, uh, this is her farm. And that's why there are rosy colored clouds above her farm. Um, this is the East, East Branch farm and she produces actually, it's kimchi harvest. And um, in thinking about this time in the farm, uh, I realized that Madeline um, this summer had farm dinners so that um, she plowed out her fields and uh, we could be socially distant um, order on a website uh, pick it up in, in a beautiful basket and and um, get the incredible dinners on the farm. And she would have, I think, two nights a week for some of the summer and fall. It was it was an incredible, magical gift. Um, you know, when, when I couldn't go anywhere to eat, I could go to Madeline <laughs> and uh, have a, a wonderful... Uh, and I think that that's such an important part in a way of the community. Um, I, um, this was also at Madeline's farm. I was painting on top of the place where you could see to the 1800s. And uh, I happened to notice on my phone, this alert and it said there was a tornado warning. I can't believe I got a signal. And so I drove down and I was nervous and I went to her farm and, and we waited it out. And it was so dramatic and beautiful. I couldn't help but paint it. Um, this is uh, from a fr another friend. Uh, they're just outside of town and um, they have, they look out at the valley and the sun sets when it sets um, in the most wonderful ways. So it's from uh, Carl and Kathleen's. And a lot of these paintings, um, including this one, were paintings from a show um, that I had at the Roxbury Art School uh, group in 2012. Uh, called Local Gets Personal. And it was really the farms and the, the local, the, the places that sort of we all share. Um, and so these are some of those, those images. Um, and this is a little soft and out of focus, but uh, it's the cutoff road in, um, I believe, late winter. Uh, and that sort of connects you from 28 to 30, you bypass uh, so that you don't have to go to Margaville and come around. Uh, uh, this is actually where the, the new rec center is right over here off the canvas, <laughs> but that's where it is. Um, so uh, in, um, in 2008, um, well, I, I kind of had an epiphany. Um, 
about farm life. Uh, this was before the radio, radio show. And um, I was, I think, uh, conversations, I guess, that I'm having with people about growing food, extreme weather conditions, um, diminishing farms and farm business. When I was at, I remember at the time it was Becker Tire. Um, and it actually was Bob uh, Bob Cronk who who now has um, the tire Grand Gorge tire, and um, he explained that what that they did they repaired farm tires and farm tires are enormous and it was a very big part of the business and the realization that um, I had been painting this landscape but I didn't really know not the people who didn't go to market I didn't know the dairy farmers whose cows I was in love with. And so I, I proposed a, a multimedia, I, I wrote a grant, uh, a deck, a decentralization grant and, and received the grant from the Roxbury Arts Group. Um, the, uh, the Town of Middletown Historical Society was, was my sponsor. And I um, embarked on uh, interviews uh, using StoryCorps equipment. Um, and so they were archived, they were 40 minute interview. They were archived with the Library of Congress and it was a way to, to share these farmers' words. Um, Liz, are you telling me it's- I'm telling you five minutes, Ellen. All right, well, all right. We wonderful. Um, I, I, so these are, um, these are some of the cows I met uh, then. Um, actually, these were on the Elliott farm and these are a, a compilation of headshots, the grass-fed girls of Delaware County in newer piece. Um, these are the darling cows at night. And these are, it was five of the, um, of the local farms. Um, I included a little audio, so let's see if we can get to it. Um, I'm gonna move quickly through the fields, uh, the railroad, back, and you'll see sites you remember. This is uh, Route 23 um, on the way to Stanford. And the oldest, I think it's the oldest house. It's the old stone from the Moore family. It's the old stone farmhouse of the Moore family, but it is a Toby Halleck's farm. It's an incredibly beautiful farm. He raises wonderful meat, um, the Elliott farm in winter. And these are the Elliots. Um, and I do have all their names. Let's see if we can, um, let's see if I can bring them up. So uh, I'm not, I wish you could hear the grace, but I'm trying to work on getting the film up on Vimeo and I will let you know. Whoops. All right, so now here we go. This is Bill and, Bill and Betty Elliott. They're no longer uh, with us, but certainly the legacy, their farm is, is a, a century farm. It's been around for a long time. Here we are at the creamery. Um, and uh, a very, very different piece. Um, 
this year, uh, when I found it difficult to paint the regular landscape, uh, I just was so, I was living here and, and so taken by what was going on. I was in a beautiful place, but there were fires raging across the country. And I was invited to participate in a show in, um, in Stanford uh, to show with the, it was called Outside Looking In. And I created this multimedia piece. It's different from anything I've ever done, but I felt it's very visceral. There's layers upon layers. Um, and uh, I felt like, it's a landscape in a way, and it was a portrait of, of what I felt we were enduring during this past year. So um, thank you. <laughs> Liz, are you Ellen, back? Yes, I'm back. That was wonderful. Thank you very much. Um, and we're going to wait till uh, uh, after Lisa talks, and then we'll talk to you and Lisa together, if that's OK. Oh, sure. Um, but this is wonderful. Lisa, would you like to join us now to talk about your work? Sure. Thank you, Ellen. I enjoyed well, looking at I'm going to stop sharing. <laughs> oh, thank you, Lisa. Yeah, thank you. OK, let's see. We'll see if this will work. OK. Are you able to see the? presentation? Yes. Okay. Now I'm having some technical difficulties too. Okay. <laughs> Can you still see everything? Okay. All right. Very That's good. Great. Looks Thank great. You. Okay. So um, it, it was really, it's been very, uh, uh, such a pleasure, um, this interaction with Ellen and learning about her work and learning some of our commonalities. Um, and so hopefully um, some of the things we've talked about will come together uh, as I, I share some of the works that I do as well. Um, so I teach at SUNY Delhi. I do, we do have a new sustainability program there that we're really excited about. And so I do co-teach one course for that. And then I teach some other courses tied to the landscape and art um, as well. Uh, and so I'll talk a little bit about my artwork um, and then uh, I'm going to be focusing in on native plants and how they can be used in art and why we might think about using them tied to the theme of sustainability. Uh, I'll talk about some of the considerations I give when I design with native plants. And then I'll share some of my favorites with you um, and hopefully inspire you to uh, use some of these plants as well. Um, so the first slide just gives you a, a kind of a sense of some of the works that I create. I do create realistic um, representational landscapes. And then I also um, create baskets using native plant materials, pizanki with botanical themes, and then sun prints and 3D um, actual landscape designs. And so today I'm gonna to be focusing mostly on um, the ones on the left here, the sun prints and then actual um, landscape design. Um, and using native plants in these um, two types of artwork. Um, while I create a variety of different uh, types of art, I'm inspired by place, much like Ellen. That was one of the themes that we found we had in common. Um, I grew up in New York State in Norwich and um, have lived here most of my life with a brief little journey to Connecticut for a, a few years and spend a lot of time summering um, on waterfronts and, and going to um, Cranberry Lake in the Adirondacks. Um, and it's in Cran at Cranberry Lake where I first started to create sun prints 13 years ago. Um, and I've slowly been kind of working on that technique. Um, so basically how I make sun prints is I create a wash, a flat wash of color using watercolor on a sheet of paper. I also paint a botanical specimen and then I put it face down on the wet piece of watercolor paper and I feed more pigment underneath the plant specimen. And then I put it on typically bluestone and let it dry in the sun and the water evaporates and the pigment pools and reveals the form. And I eventually you know, pull the plant specimen back off of the, um, the paper and it reveals the print. So I create these sorts of artwork um, and use native plants in uh, actual landscape designs too. So I'm gonna be kind of talking about both of those and pairing them together um, for the remainder of the slides. 
So when I talk about a native plant, it basically means a species of a, a plant that has originated in an area, a region, um, growing there naturally. And when I'm talking about in the United States, this is pre-European. Um, the opposite of this would be an exotic, non-native or non-indigenous species. Um, that would be a plant species that didn't originate in that region. Um, with all definitions, um, we can think about some issues with this kind of, um, set up, right? Native on one side, non-native on the other. For example, what's your region you're looking at? Um, so uh, on, on the east coast here, we have um, beautiful trout lily that look like this. When I was hiking on the west, um, this was, I think, around, uh, and around Mount Rainier. Um, they have a different kind of uh, species um, that's similar but different, right? So what's your region? And for today's purpose, I'm going to be talking about plants native to the northeast. Um, some species, we don't really know what the native range is, and that's the case for Catalpa. Um, so again, there's some fuzzy lines, um, but basically we're going to be focusing on things that originated in the Northeast um, for what we're looking at today. So I have a question for you, and you can try to type some of your thoughts into the, um, I think we're going to be using the chat box for this. Uh, why do you think it might be a good idea to use native plants if we're thinking about sustainability um, and you know why might you use them? And yes, you can use the chat button to type in some answers. I'm not sure if I see the chat. Aha, to avoid non-native invasive species taking over existing species. Great, yeah, so that's definitely a concern. Um, and that's one of the reasons I really enjoy using native plants um, because they did originate in the area. And there have been studies that suggest that certain species, especially those that are endangered or threatened, um, can be very vulnerable to uh, invasive species that, have, um, that spread much more readily. Avoid second blight. Okay, so sometimes um, there's also disease concerns um, coming in. They evolve in our region, so they're well suited to thrive here, right? And so this is also a really good um, point because it could lead to you having to do less maintenance, um, less use of less fertilizers, maybe less watering, um, because again, it's you're using a plant that's adapted to that region. Can you think of any other ideas? A pretty good list. Let's see what else I had up here. I think you got most of these. Um, I'm going to start with beauty <laughs> because I find great beauty in many of our native species. I and I think of them as I think about um, making art and a sense of place. Thank you. Yeah, that's another very important one for me. When I go hiking um, around Delhi, I don't want it to feel the same as when I go hiking outside of Seattle or, you know, wherever I may be. So um, sense of place is really important um, as well. So um, good, we're gonna move on. Um, and again, I think Shelly in the chat talked about um, invasive species and that's another um, good reason to use native plants is because you will avoid planting on accident um, a species that could become a threat to our um, na native e ecosystems. So some of the things I think about when I make art with native plants um, are, first of all, composition. And so I think about composition um, vertically and horizontally. So vertically, um, when I design with plants, I think about a canopy, a shrub layer, and then an understory layer. And I'm going to kind of share some favorite plants that, that fit through um, those layers with you today. Um, also, I think horizontally, and there's been studies done that look at the horizontal distribution and the density of species and how that impacts wildlife. So for example, flying squirrels need more forested kind of um, forest habitat. And then other uh, wildlife species can have a very broad range um, from open fields into um, mature forests and they can use lots of the different spaces in between those um, types of habitat. So I think both vertically and horizontally as I'm designing. 
Um, uh, one of the landscapes that I have the most familiarity with is our little yard and we live in the village and we have a very, very tiny yard. And when we moved here, it was mostly all grass and just a couple of, um, a couple of foundation plants. And we've slowly worked to remove the grass and plant more and more native species in our yard. Um, and in so doing, whoops, we really have just watched wildlife just flourish um, and come to the yard. And it's been a great pleasure for our children to experience that in the village in our in our backyard that is really tiny. It's like a postage size, postage stamp um, size yard. Uh, so it's it's been very fun to watch it evolve from grass to a much more diverse um, system. I also think about color um, quite a bit. And so obviously we have the fall color um, of foliage. We can play with flower color, you know, using complementary color schemes um, and things of that nature. And when I make the sun prints, I usually try to use a color that in some way is inspired by the plant that I'm working with um, as well. Uh, native plants can be delicious. <laughs> and so um, we, you know, our children, we have a lot of fun um, growing native plants and eating native plants. And, you know, from blueberries to wintergreen, um, our kids know where to go to harvest particular plants and, um, and to eat them and use them, as I said, for basketry. I'm just starting to kind of pioneer um, doing some of that as well. So with that brief introduction, we're just going to look at a couple of my favorites. And there are so many plants to choose from that are native to this region. So these are really some of my highlights. Um, and uh, just know that there are many more wonderful th uh, species as well. So starting with spring wildflowers, spring ephemerals, these are ones that come up for a little while and then they'll senesce and sort of disappear. Um, so one of my very favorites is Sanguinaria canadensis, this bloodroot. And I love this plant because it comes in the spring and um, the flower is kind of hidden in the leaf and then slowly the flower kind of emerges uh, up above and the leaf starts to open and it's just stunning and beautiful. Um, and then eventually it usually rains and the flowers are shattered and all the petals fall off. Um, it's called bloodroot because the rhizomes have a really orange red blood like color and again I kind of used the orange and thought about that um, in making the, uh, the print of this plant. Another one I love are uh, Virginia bluebells. Um, they come up in the springtime as well. Um, and I love these because it's hard for me as a designer to find a true blue um, flower. And this, this species has blues and purples and pinks all on the plant. Um, and it's a, a really lovely, a, a lovely spring flower. And it, it's a nice one um, because you start to see some bee activity coming to these. So it's for me kind of, again, another sign of spring and I start to see insects out again. And I love the springtime. So this is one of my favorites as well. Um, there are many other spring ephemerals from trilliums to trout lily I already mentioned and spring beauty. Um, so many choices, but those are just a couple of highlights um, of those. Moving into perennials now, so these are species that you would um, see for longer in your landscape. Um, violets are, are really beautiful and there are many different native violets. Um, I also really like Jack in the Pulpit. I find this uh, plant to have a, a really unique um, structure. Uh, so you can see it kind of has tall leaves and then it has the space that has a kind of a maroon color on it and the stems are speckled with maroon. And again, I bring those colors and hues into the, the printing process as well. Uh, many different, uh, you can use many different sclepia or milkweed. Um, again, some species are designed more for wet areas and some for dry. So the one on the left, Asclepias incarnata, does better in wetter environments and Asclepia tuberosa, you would find more in a drier, more normal um, soil range. Um, so different colors and some for different types of soils you know, conditions that you may have on your site. They come up a little later, so I, you sometimes forget you have planted them, um, but when they come up, they're really beautiful. And we know they're an important source for monarchs. You can see the chrysalis here on this one. Um, 
Minarda Didima is another one that I enjoy watching the wildlife come to. Um, bee balm is the common name for this. It can get um, pretty tall. Ours is about probably about 26 to 32 inches tall. And um, the, the hummingbirds, uh, they go around from flower to flower in a circle around um, sipping the nectar from these beautiful um, red color and very fragrant, really wonderful fragrant, really fresh um, fragrance. Um, and the leaves can be used for tea. And my, my children like to suck on the, the flowers, have a very sweet um, taste. Shalung oblica, uh, turtle head, is so called because when you squeeze the edge of the flowers there, they open and shut like a turtle um, mouth, or yeah, looks like a turtle mouth. Um, this one flowers a little later in the season. It can take some shade, has a really wonderful clumping form and a coarse texture. And the bees go in here. And when I walk by this thing, the whole plant is humming. Um, and so it's a really a, a nice um, species for a number of reasons, again, including a, in a contact with um, insects. Eupatorium, I put this in here because if you need a good screening plant, Eupatorium is well suited for that. And again, there are different species for different conditions of moisture, but ours is taller than my head and I, we use it to screen our compost um, so that people aren't seeing our composter. And it has some pink and purple and that is brought into the leaves as well. Um, and you can see that in the printing too. Um, you also have uh, cone flowers and you have Redbeckia. Um, on this slide paired together. So they're flowering a little later, like mid season, you'll start to see the flowers here. You can see a hummingbird moth on um, the Redbeckia here. Uh, and if you leave the Echinacea, if you can handle not being really, really tidy in the fall, um, some of the finches will eat the seeds. Um, if you can leave them, I usually leave things and then tidy up in the spring so that the birds have some seed sources through um, the feeding of the winter time. Um, moving even later in flower, we have um, goldenrod paired with aster here. Aster has a nice clumping form um, and the goldenrod is light and airy. So I like them contrasted together in terms of color and in terms of their structure. Um, and so you can see that here and obviously again, um, important for insects and butterflies um, as well. There are many vines and ground covers to look at if you need uh, a native species to choose from. Um, Parthenocystis quinquefolia, that's a tongue twister for me tonight, is the one that I've chosen to focus on because it has this stunning fall color. You cannot miss it when you're driving around and it's um, fall. It can reach about 50 feet tall. It can tolerate sun and shade. Um, and it, again, quinquefolia, so five-leaved um, form that you see. Um, there are smaller ground covers and so vines, um, so you can pick things that you know are really well suited for what you're looking for. Spring, um, spring foam flower over here on the left um, is much more small and petite, but can make a nice ground cover. And I also really like a serum canadensis over here, wild ginger um, as well. And my children like the strawberries too. Um, ferns, we, my husband studies ferns. Um, he's a plant ecologist. So we grow a lot of ferns on our property as well. Um, and they all have unique qualities and can make a nice ground cover. Um, so Adiantum pedatum is very dainty. Um, you can see that here. Polystichum acrysticoides is an evergreen species. Um, so it's really nice in the winter time to have a fern that still has um, leaf, you know, coverage on it. And then um, we have on the right here, um, Osmundium cinnamonium, cinnamon fern. Oh, sorry, they changed the name on this. I got to read the title. They said they change plant names sometimes. And this one just changed to Osmundastrum um, cinnamonium. Um, and it's so called because the, um, the fronds up here, the sporing bodies turned kind of an orange. And I use that to kind of inspire the print that I did with that plant. Just a few shrubs and trees. Um, so again, we're thinking about going vertically up in height. Um, Amelanchia is one of my favorites. Um, it's service berry, it flowers in the springtime, it gets berries, and then it can have 
this beautiful peach fall color that I don't see on anything else. It can get more orange and red in fall color too. It depends. And you can get nice clump forming um, shrubs um, in this uh, species. Um, and their different species reach different heights um, for this particular, it's a taller shrub, if you will. And it's a bird magnet. Um, th these fruits are very popular with our, the birds in the neighborhood. Uh, Circus canadensis is on the left. It has a beautiful magenta, uh, well, you know, magenta, pink, purple um, flowers that sometimes come before the leaves. And then when they fall, this was um, at Cornell. I used to walk by this tree all the time. And when the flowers fall down, the whole path would be pink and it was really magical. Um, so it's a really nice, again, taller shrub. Some classify it as a small tree. Um, so it's in between there. Um, you could expect it to get maybe 25 feet high. Uh, and then on the right, you have witch hazel, which um, the one that we have in our yard, there's two different species. One flowers in the fall and one can flower in the spring or winter. Um, so this one's a fall flowering um, hamamelis or witch hazel, and that could reach about 20 feet and has a nice yellow fall color. Uh, Cornus cerasea or red osier dogwood has it's called red osier dogwood because it has red branches. And again, in the winter time, I like seeing some color in the landscape. And so this one is really quite beautiful. You can also get a yellow twigged form and different heights are available um, as well. Uh, Ilex glabra is a, a native um, a type of holly that's an evergreen. Um, it's a little bit weak wooded, but it has nice glossy uh, leaves. You just wouldn't want to put it where you're going to pile your snow talking from experience there. Um, and then Ilex verticillata over here, it's deciduous, but it has these stunning red berries and it tends to grow in wet, wetter areas. And if you're driving around, you'll see these branches full of berries. Um, after they freeze and thaw a couple of times, then birds will eat them, but they persist for a while in the winter um, and they're really, really beautiful. Lisa, we're yeah. at 20 minutes, just okay. so you know. Thank I'm you. I'm almost done, so that sounds perfect. Um, blueberries, we've already talked about, but there's high bush and low bush um, and very delightful. They have a nice red fall color. Um, so they're a good um, species for many reasons um, to use in the landscape. And then the last um, one, I kind of put four trees together here to think about. There are many native trees. Many of us don't have big yards. And so I just focused on four. Asa rubrum or red maple up here has a rounded form. It um, has a red fall color uh, and it's uh, about 60 feet high. Nissa sylvatica sweet gum can have all different colors on it during the fall and its branches sort of spiral up if you look underneath it and that's very neat. Um, Betula nigra uh, river birch has this exfoliating bark and sort of this arching weeping form to it. It's a fast grower and it can get about 70 feet high. And then there are many native oaks that are very sturdy and different, suited to different conditions. Um, so those are some of my favorites. There are many others. Um, my tips for you, if you're gonna design and um, use native plants is to start small because every site's different, to have patience because they say the saying is the plants sleep, creep and leap over three years. Um, plant in masses, uh, usually in triangular formula, uh, formations, and then use reputable sources. You might pay more, but the last thing we want is for native plants to be harvested from our beautiful landscapes and then shipped somewhere else where they may or may not survive. Um, so it's important to get sources that are um, growing their plants sustainably and, um, you know, um, aren't and are harvesting them sustainably. Um, which can also be done. So that's all I have. And I look forward to um, talking with you all and answering any questions. Thank you very much, Lisa. Yeah. Um, before we get into a conversation, I did see in the chat that Jenny Shear was asking if you could give um, the names of the ferns, uh, the ordinary names of the ferns. So I don't know if that's something you can scroll back to quickly. Yes. Okay, so we have maiden hair fern on. Are, are you still able to see it? I was trying to yes. stop, share. Okay, maiden hair fern on the left, um, and then Christmas fern um, in the center, 
and then cinnamon fern um, here on the right with a bunch of violets, it looks like underneath. <laughs> um, so yeah. Thank you. Yep. Uh, I'll stop the share now so we can see everybody. That was wonderful. Thank you very much. And Ellen, I hope you can join us and um, we'll go on and have a conversation. And uh, I don't know, Will, do you want to start us off? Do, we, do you have any thoughts to tie it together? Sure. Once again, the last time I took lots of notes and once again, I've got pages and pages, um, lots of lots of very quotable lines. So thank you and beautiful pictures. Um, I, I was struck in both of your presentations uh, by the importance, uh, as you emphasized, of place, but also of process, you know, and, and process over a really extended period of time, right? This was it, this is long-term work that is rooted in place, and you know that's just um, to me so so impressive and 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 so important. You know, um, you know you were engaged in in the first session a couple of weeks ago. We we talked about close looking and the importance of close looking, and and you're both engaged in this close looking um, as a regular practice and returning again and again, right? Um, you know, I'm struck when I, I run a lot in the Cooperstown area and, uh, and run in all seasons and the changes are wonderful. And uh, I do, I love, I love spring. And I've told my students, you know, the birds are coming, you know, and, and they're going to be here soon. And there's so, some of them are already here. Yeah, yeah. And, uh, and, and it, you feel that change. Um, also this idea that you're exploring your home. These are home landscapes. You know, you're not going somewhere else to this wild exotic place, but you're, you're discovering all of these wonders, you know, literally in your backyard, right? Um, one, one of the goals that we had in, in kind of putting this series together was to you know, sort of connect landscapes and art and all that appreciation to action, right? Um, and of course, the act of close looking, that, that's an action, that's an important action and being rooted in place. Um, but I, I guess I wonder if both of you would say just a little bit more about how your art intersects with, with your actions, you know, and, and particularly actions related to kind of building a, a more sustainable world and, 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 and hopefully more sustainable future. Um, I think Lisa, Lisa's muted, so I don't. Hi, uh, Ellen. Uh, go uh, ahead. You, uh, would you like to go first, Ellen? Um, well, I mean, I, I, you know, that was everything you said was so thoughtful that I'm thinking. <laughs> <laughs> but um, I, I was going to, I mean, one of the things, you know, that that just comes to mind. I mean, I, it's obviously something I think about every day. I, um, I was thinking about this uh, essay that Lewis Th Thomas, uh, he was a biologist. He wrote The Lives of a Cell, um, The Life of a Cell, I think. And um, anyways, he said that maybe we could all be the, uh, maybe we are the eyes of the earth, um, uh, that, that we are, you know, he's trying to think of a use for us because we've done so many things so poorly. Um, but he said, perhaps we could be uh, the eyes of the earth. And uh, I was watching a, um, a TED talk from someone who was an environmentalist. And she said, who's an environmentalist? And, uh, you know, nobody raised their hand. And then she said, you know, or three people. And she laughed. And um, she said, the picture that you have of people who care about that. And, and she basically said that if you have a phone and you're, and I mean, it's true. I mean, I do it every day. You're outside and you see a bird or you hear a bird and you kind of take that. And the next step is, is that there are people researching all those things and they actually need our input. So um, for a change, instead of just taking you away from life, it could be something that helps preserve. So um, I just found out that part of it, but but I like to think that uh, uh, that looking and observing closely and 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 studying a place over time um, activates me to be engaged in my community, um, whether it's being engaged uh, 
for uh, a local cleanup or uh, again, uh, uh, Lisa, for planting uh, things that are native to the area. Um, and then um, I started a rate, I did the, um, the face of farming because I wanted the voices of the farmers to be heard. Um, and uh, there, there is an hour film and uh, you know, I, wish, I wish I could have shared more of that today, but I think that, that stimulates activism. And then I start, started a radio show. Um, that we've been doing for 10 years. And I guess I feel like and, and that's really about sustainability um, and local farming and how to support that and how to, um, you know, take that on yourself. So, I mean, those are three ways aside from, uh, you know, the organizations that I feel loyal and, and, and I try to support, but, but it's hard. There's a lot of work. <laughs> yeah, yeah. That's that's a um, a great question, and I I think for me it um, the art and place based art makes me stop and slow down, and like you said, look carefully. And I think with sustainability, that's so important because we live at such a fast pace um, that we just don't have time sometimes to stop and look and think. Um, and then we make decisions, right, that are fast paced too, and maybe not clearly thought out. And so I think for all those reasons, um, basing yourself in a place and really looking at it helps you to then appreciate it. Um, so. That's great. Lisa, um, I'm looking at a question from the chat. So while we have you, um, uh, Jeannie Ellsworth asked you to explain sleep creep and leap a little bit more. Yeah, I had never heard this before. Um, we were in Connecticut and we were either buying or selling our house there. And our lawyer kept saying that to me about plants. And I thought, what is he talking about? And then I I asked him, what are you talking about? And he explained it and I've, I'll never forget. And um, it's a really great saying because it's so true. So the first year you plant something, it sort of sleeps. You're not gonna expect it to do miraculous things the first year. And you're gonna wanna baby it the first year. You're gonna wanna water it well. Um, the second year, um, they start to creep. You see a little bit more growth. You, you get to you start to get your expectations up. And then really the third year, um, they should become established and they really start to leap. Um, so uh, that was, a, a, I think his, the gentleman's name was Luddy. Um, and I don't know if that's from somewhere else, um, but it's something that I've always um, kept with me. And uh, it, I think it's a, a definitely a great little saying. That's great, thank you. Yeah. Sorry, the, the cat actually took the headset. Um, so helpful. <laughs> Not Mind her to slow down. Uh, uh, Will, I just I wanted to add one thing because uh, as uh, listening to Lisa and then hearing what you said, um, the the notion that I think if we have a relationship with something and a connection, it helps us to care about it and want to work uh, to preserve it. Um, I mean, I think that was true for the Hudson River, uh, the first school of art. And, and I feel that's true that I've noticed when people, um, you know, I had farmers come into a show that I had and they apologized for not getting dressed. And I, I mean, I had tears in my eyes, I was so touched. And they were so excited to see places that, that they knew and that meant something. And so I think the more that that people can come into contact with things that they might see every day, but maybe not stop to look at. Um, I think that that helps, you know, it, it's one way of, of helping forge relationships and connections with living things mm -hmm. and our environment. And I think that that is so important as we think about um, bearing witness to all sorts of challenges in our environment today is that yeah. sense of connection. Um, I will add that I had a tourism committee meeting today and uh, we were talking in a roundabout way about the importance of sense of place that we may sometimes take for granted, but what is 
so attractive to people who come to our communities, our Delaware County community, our Catskills community from outside, realize how special and unique it is. And so stopping and slowing down and really breathing in and embracing our wonderful surroundings and, and appreciating them the way people who come to visit us appreciate them is something we all might remember to do more too. Yeah, I think about that sometimes when I'm watching a, a nature show that's showing Peru or, you know, the Andes and we're looking at these animals, exotic animals. And and I think, well, for the people there, they're just normal, you know, and, and so what are the the things around here that we look at? Oh, you know, that's just a squirrel, you know, <laughs> but somebody, if you framed it in, in that romantic kind of way, they might ooh and ah over this thing. And maybe we should, you know, I... I like, you had juncos on your list, dark-eyed juncos, and, and they're in the backyard all the time. And not this, with this winter, we had some cats around, not our cats, some other cats who I think scared them away. So I haven't had them as much, but, you know, I've just come to appreciate these little ground feeder juncos because um, they're right outside this, literally this window right here, you know, and so there are a lot of things I think that we, we can take for granted, but are are really uh, uh, precious and 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 beautiful. And, and in every environment, you know, it doesn't have to be those amazing Hudson River Valley vistas, but yep. just our backyards, just the the fields we we take for granted as we drive down the road. Um, I'm looking at our chat and Peter Blue, who's a, one of the museum's board member, wanted me to remind everybody that Wendell Berry said that something like, oh, sorry, it moved. <laughs> something, <laughs> Wendell Berry said something like, you can only learn to love the world by loving some small bit of it. So he, yes. he wanted to share that Wendell Berry quote, which is Thank perfect you. for this moment. Um, Do we want to read Ginny's sure. comment too? Yeah. Sure. Ginny Shear um, noted that um, to Ellen, there are many things that divide longtime local residents from those of us who have moved here. I think your artworks, your depictions of a landscape very familiar to me are something that both groups can unite and appreciate and or more than appreciate love. And actually it's interesting because what, I, I love all of your artwork, but the piece you showed us of the Manhattan Country School Farm, which was a little bit different than a lot of your other work, um, really struck me. And, and that was really beautiful. And, and Ginny and Walt um, have played a very important role in that. Yeah. I realized that when I saw Ginny's name, but I didn't, <laughs> I, I didn't think of it then. Yeah. And, and, you know, I think it's really interesting um, having Ellen and Lisa juxtaposed here because so much is, is place-based, but Lisa in kind of the minutia of place and Ellen in the very vast kind of very broad expression of place. And, and yet both are extremely striking and uh, it's, um, it's, really nice to juxtapose both of your work and what, what inspires you. And I wanted to note Ellen's last painting, The Bearing Witness, the, the, her reflections on um, 2020. And um, I, I thought it was really amazing how, to me, in looking at that picture, very painting very quickly, how you wove in some of our built environment. And, um, you know, it, it was so different from what you normally do, um, but um, yet very, uh, very challenging for uh, all the things we're thinking about this past year and all the things we're thinking about through the interactions as well. Um, we've looked at some really beautiful art tonight and talked about some very um, important things about our, our environment that have inspired both of you. Um, yet uh, this program is really rooted in challenges of uh, environmental uh, justice and resource justice and, um, and justice in general. And uh, 
So I, I think it, it's it's really um, amazing the range of, of work you showed us and the peace and beauty and then the, the striking challenges uh, that you uh, ended with. And yeah. Uh, yeah, and it reminded me, Liz, of Christina Hunt Wood's work as well, where, yeah. you know, this juxtaposition of these, man, it, it, some, I felt like there were some of the same places <laughs> in Ellen's work, maybe, maybe not, but, you know, um, of, of, you know, taking these photographs of beer cans and these very pastoral, uh, idyllic locations, and then also talking about the Confederate flag at the Delaware County Fair and, you know, racial justice and in our communities as well, so. Um, All right, I, I appreciate that. Yeah, yeah, I appreciate I appreciated that that juxtaposition in both your work and and and, and in hers. Yeah. And um, we have another comment from uh, Jeannie, Jeannie Ellsworth too. Um, it's one thing that the pandemic has done for me. I typically go afar a few times a year to see birds. This year, it's been all local, same walk every day. And, and uh, I think many of us, like you said, Will, about your backyard, and for me, it was every night having dinner on the front porch, and the same hummingbird would come and see us, and the crows would hang out, and one night the crows were flipping out, and I realized my brother was on the porch with us, and he's usually not there, and I think they they wanted they were protecting us because there was a stranger <laughs> on the porch <laughs> so some people have dogs we have crows <laughs> I, I, you know i went and this actually maybe a question for lisa we saw a lot of hummingbirds last summer and i wondered if that was because there was you know reduced cars on the road <laughs> there was a few fewer killed i don't know but it, there were an abundance and we usually get hanging basket, ba baskets to attract them, but. Uh, yeah, I don't know. That's a good question. I'm, I'm not, I'm not sure about that. Um, I've only ever once found a, a dead hummingbird once, and it, I picked it up to move it to a better spot, and it was the lightest thing. It's like holding air. I mean, it was just an incredible thing to hold in your hand. Um, but yeah, it's a good a good thought. I just I don't I don't know. Unfortunately, I don't know the answer. Yeah, I, we saw quite a few as well. Yep. well I think I should. Uh, uh, I'm hoping to join Jeannie on some uh, bird walks. But uh, in this uh, spare social socializing time, I've been my next uh, my next series may involve the uh, chickadees. Mm -hmm. That are uh, they? They're acrobats. I mean, they perform at my on. Um, I guess they're the rose, wild rose bushes. So you have these incredible long branches, and they just like it's unbelievable the acrobatics. And and um, I'm working up. I don't know how and what, but I'll let you know. <laughs> <laughs> it's a gift. The chickadees. <laughs> Yeah, they, uh, they're, they're all kinds of gifts if we, if we stop and look and listen. Will, any other thoughts or Ellen or, or Lisa, would you like to say anything else? Just that I, you know, love me meeting all of you and working with you. Uh, it's been such a, a wonderful, uh, really a present. And, you know, as we're learning to cherish every moment, uh, it, these have been wonderful moments. I mean, hard, the technology was hard and, you know, having, trying to do what I wanted to do uh, was hard, but uh, you did it, it. <laughs> <laughs> and that's that's the great thing it, it yeah. worked <laughs> but I was thinking about that Saturday Night Live early on in the pandemic <laughs> 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 We're, we've we are all there every day Alan don't worry <laughs> and I think I think Will and Lisa more than anybody with all the classes they're teaching online and all those oh. challenges I can't even imagine <laughs> Well, thank you for the opportunity. Yes, thank you um, to Hanford Mills and the grad, uh, Cooperstown Graduate Program. Um, it's been it's been really wonderful, and like Ellen said, it's a nice reprieve um, from everything that's going on. And 
it's been uh, really lovely looking at larger landscape images and then thinking about zooming in at different scales um, and thinking about sustainability connected to that. So I, I think and her, Hermione perfect. wants to say good night. Oh. Well. <laughs> <laughs> and we should we should let folks know that the next program is March 25th. Right. Is that right? Yeah, I believe and, and so. Yes, it is. And that will be Jay Unger and Molly Mason, uh, our um, wonderful musical treasures uh, who founded the Ashokan Center uh, for Arts and Nature. So we, we're really excited that they'll be joining us next. And then we'll offer one more in early April with um, uh, Richard and Josh, Richard Walker and Josh Sierra will be joining us to talk about um, their perspectives um, from the arts and um, yes, sorry, excuse me. Oh my goodness, yes. <laughs> Richard, oh, I'm sorry. Oh, artist. <laughs> this is way past my bedtime, folks. <laughs> <laughs> Richard Kathman and Jeff Sierra, and it was Josh's name who I couldn't remember, <laughs> um, but they'll be joining us as well. So I, I think we, we really have been uh, so blessed to have um, so many uh, great perspectives. Uh, Kisa, uh, we she just uh, put up the program from the last interactions um, that we had a few weeks ago. And uh, so that's now, that recording is now up. And if folks did not get to see that, uh, please watch that. This recording will be up soon. And um, we will have recordings of each of these sessions available for people if they wanted to encourage other people to take a look at them. On the yes. website, our, all of our recordings will be put up on our YouTube channel oh. and you can find information um, for our upcoming programs and uh, links to register on our website, which is hanfordmills.org. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks for cleaning that up, Kisa. <laughs> <laughs> we need a night owl to end the program. <laughs> That's not me, but I'm happy to play cleanup. <laughs> Thank all right, you all thank you all for coming much. and uh, we look forward to seeing you again at the next session. Okay. Thank you. Good night. Good night. Good night. Good night. Good night.